We noted in the last video that if a system is autonomous, if we can properly regard it as being a law unto itself, as self-causing, it can still be perturbed or influenced, but the response that you get is not a um, the response of something which is being controlled. Rather, it's it emerges from the endogenous activity of the system itself, and this is a hallmark of the living. And we also noted that all real systems enter into all kinds of relationships of mutuality in the world all the time. And so we are idealizing if we sever any system which we are observing from some of its embedding and attachments to the world. We noted earlier also that when we adopt the language of dynamical systems, we are not using something which presupposes um, any pre-given system. That is to say, we can use this systems level approach to understand, for example, a hand or part of the body or the body plus a hammer or 16 bodies and a pickup truck. Um, our delineation of the system lies in our framing activities as scientists. So it's very, care very important to note that when we speak of a system, in a dynamical sense, we are not necessarily picking out what we would normally think of as an agent in the world. So we're going to look now at a counterexample to this decom decomposability. We're going to look at a dynamical system which um, takes as its state variables the population of lynxes and hares, I think. It's a predator-prey model uh, in an area and models their covariation over time. And what's important to note here is that the, the manner in which this is framed, the manner in which the system is delineated, doesn't allow for the predator or the prey to be taken out of the relationship. So there is the autonomy of this system lies in, in the predator-prey, and not in the predator and the prey. Um, it also, it, um, just by chance, it's a nice illustration of how dynamical systems can be explored graphically, almost tactilely. It's actually a demonstration of a um, tablet interface for exploring dynamical systems, and I don't think it ever went any further, but um, here it is anyway. It's pretty nice. I'd like to show you a new user interface for exploring dynamical systems. These things show up everywhere in science and engineering. A dynamical system is a set of variables and a set of rules saying how those variables change over time. Those rules are called differential equations. For this demo, I'm going to show you a simple, well-known system called the predator-prey problem. In some ecosystem, you have a population of predators and a population of prey. If there are too many predators, they overhunt the prey. Then the predators starve, the prey population grows back again, and you get these cycles. If you look at this problem on Wikipedia, you see this. It takes a lot of effort to decode these equations and figure out what's going on here. And these are just the rules of the system. You can't actually see how the system behaves, which is what you care about. Here's a different way of representing the system. The two variables, number of predators and number of prey, are shown as plots over time. So you immediately see the behavior of the system. You see those cycles I was talking about. If I tap on a variable, it comes up big at the bottom, and I can run my finger over it and get the actual numbers. To compare the two variables, I can tap on both of them at the same time, and now I have two overlapping plots at the bottom. On the right is a phase-based plot, which plots predators on the x-axis, prey on the y-axis. And we can see how they both change over time. Notice how the cursor on the phase-based plot follows where my finger is moving on the time plot. A dynamic system can behave completely differently when you start off the variables with different initial values. You'll see there's a little knob next to where the initial predator population is plotted. Moving this knob up and down adjusts the initial population size, and you can see how the system behavior changes. On the face space plot, there's also a knob at the initial point of the trajectory. Moving this knob around adjusts the initial values of both variables simultaneously. This sort of two-dimensional adjustment is really powerful. For example, there's an equilibrium in the system, a certain population size, where the behavior flattens out entirely. I can kind of find this equilibrium by adjusting the initial values of variables individually. But when I move the phase space knob, 
I can see the trajectory tightening around a single point, and I just follow my eyes without thinking. My finger can go straight there. To see the rules that say how a variable changes over time, I can grab this handle under the variable and pull out a little drawer, which contains the rates that are controlling this variable. The first row is the growth rate, which is proportional to population size. This leads to simple exponential growth. The second row is the consumption rate, how quickly the prey are eaten. And that's proportional to predators times prey, which models how often predators and prey meet each other. The plots show the instantaneous rates over time, so you can see how each of the rules is influencing the variables. These two rates are simply integrated together, growth minus consumption, and that gives you the prey population over time. And if you look where these rates are defined, this is literally the differential equation. You can read it right off. P prey dt equals a coefficient times prey minus coefficient times predators times prey. So this is the differential equation, but it doesn't feel equation-y to me because every term of the equation has a name, so you know what it means, and it has a plot, so you can see what it does. Each of these rates is scaled by a coefficient that says how strongly the rule applies. You can adjust a coefficient by moving the knob that's next to it. If I want to see what happens if the birth rate of prey is really high, I just grab the knob and turn it up. I can freely play around with all the parameters in the system and get a sense for how they affect the dynamics. Here, I'm trying different initial values for the predators. And it would be nice if I could see all of these possibilities at once. If I hold down the button labeled sweep and tap on a knob, the knob explodes out into 10 little dots. And now I have 10 overlapping plots, one for each of these 10 initial values. I can play with the other parameters in the system, and I can see how the system behaves in all 10 of these cases. This is really powerful, because right now, I'm essentially looking at the system across three dimensions at once. I'm seeing behavior for all of time, I'm seeing behavior for all initial values of this variable, and I'm looking across whatever parameter I'm currently interacting with. This was a little prototype I made in a few days, and I don't necessarily think that this is the best UI for this sort of thing. I'm going in some different directions right now, but there are two core concepts here which I think are really important. One is ubiquitous visualization. You can see everything. In Tufti's words, this shows the data. Every variable and every term of every equation is shown as a plot over time, so you can see what it's actually doing. There are no naked symbols. The second concept is in-context manipulation. If you want to change an initial value, there's a knob literally next to the initial value. If you want to change a coefficient, there's a knob next to the coefficient. You reach in and literally manipulate the equations. This lets you build a strong intuition for how the parts of the equation affect the behavior. Today, most scientists and engineers explore these systems by tweaking numbers in MATLAB code and then typing the plot command. That may have been a pretty good way of working in the early 80s but I think it's time for something better. Remarkable system this person has built there. And if you come across any more like that, let me know, because this one didn't have a follow-up. Um, we need these kinds of intuitive forms of interacting with our models in order to really understand what they do. This particular example is very important from our point of view because predator and prey form a single system Neither of them has an endogenous behavior. If you take one of them away, the other one goes to zero. So there's no autonomy here, except for the system as a whole. Now you might think a predator is an agent and a prey is an agent, and this demonstrates clearly that in our discussions around autonomy, when it comes to interactions, agency is a distinct concept from autonomy. This is something I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about. There's an article for it, about it if you're interested. What about those cases where we have autonomous systems, but then they do interact? These are really important. Systems, dynamical systems which interact with each other, will influence each other. And they will become relatively non-independent. And we speak then of relationships of coupling or entrainment. I'm not going to really distinguish between the two terms. Um, coupling arises when two systems are not independent of each other, so the change in one goes along with changing the other. Two hands in a handshake are coupled. 
Entrainment is usually described as the process of falling into this relationship. So if you're walking down the street with someone and slowly your, your gait synchronizes, you've become entrained to each other. So entrainment is, as I use it, is falling into this relationship and coupled is the relationship that arises. Now, two people walking down a street are on roughly equal terms. They're about the same size and you influence me like I influence you. Now, if I go out into my garden on a sunny day, I receive heat from the sun and become influenced by the sun. And I suppose I influence the sun in return, but it's a bit of a one-way relationship, to be honest with you. And when we, when we look at relationships like that, we often say that there's a forcing relationship. That is, it's asymmetrical. So one system exerts an entraining force on the other but is not itself meaningfully affected. You can see this as entrainment, which the warming example didn't really give, um, in the phenomenon of jet lag, because you have chemical processes in your body which are sensitively tuned to the diurnal cycle. And when you hop around the globe from east to west or vice versa, you throw that out of whack. And the process of overcoming jet lag is the business of entraining this endogenous dynamic to the external dynamic. Normally they are strongly coupled. You have sundered that and you need to re-entrain your system to the ambient world. That's why the best way to get over jet lag is go outside and expose yourself to the sun. No doubt about it. Here's a nice example of two pendula, which are always our simplest dynamical systems, which are coupled. And in this case, they're coupled uh, by virtue of hanging from a single string. This is a fun experiment to do yourself if you tie a piece of string between the backs of two chairs and hang a few forks off. Um, you get very in interesting forms of behavior where the energy of the system as a whole is passed around from one unit to the next. So coupling does not mean being in lockstep necessarily. There are all kinds of coupling relationships um, depending on what, how strong the links are between us. If we are bound together, then we are completely non-independent. But if there's sort of rubber bands holding us together, then the coupling is more negotiable, as it were. It's interesting to listen to applause because coupling relationships sometimes arise spontaneously when crowds of people clap. Um, and one can fall into a form of synchronization. And there are cultural differences as to when people are willing to do that. So in Eastern Europe, it is considered a great thing if in the applause at the end of a performance, everyone, first of all, applauds, and then those applauses synchronize, become coupled. Whereas in Western Europe, synchronous clapping is an indication of displeasure. So we have this available to us, and it manifests itself in different ways in different cultures. Coupling is very obvious and can be very regular in walking, where the two legs are very obviously coupled. Now, how do we represent coupling formally? Well, here are two equations. Ignore, if you will, the functions on the right-hand side, the functions g and h, and just look at the functions on the left-hand side. x1 acceleration minus this function um, constitutes one autonomous dynamical system. And in fact, if we got rid of everything on the right-hand side, we could take that F term, put it over to the other side of the equal sign, and then we would have the F equals MA relationship. We would have the acceleration. The second derivative is a function of the two state variables, position and velocity, and some parameters. And exactly the same applies to the second. So we have two autonomous systems. But we've added in extra terms on the right-hand side so that the unfolding of the state variable for the first system is influenced by its own state, x1 and x1 dot, but also by the state of the other, by x2 and x2 dot. Likewise, the coupling function on the right-hand side of the second equation includes not only the variables x2 and x2 dot, but also the variables x1 and x1 dot. And in this case, g and h could be identical functions or they could be different functions. But this is how we formally capture the mutuality among um, interacting systems. And in the, those relatively rare cases where we have a 
system which admits of analytical decomposition, this is a nice way of expressing formally where the different terms lie. So the left-hand terms are autonomous dynamical systems and the right-hand terms are coupling functions. Now there's a generic property of dynamical systems that if they can interact they will influence one another. Um, if there's some sort of compatibility, and I use that word vaguely, between them, then they were quite likely to fall into some kind of intelligible relationship. If they are entirely of different natures, then no obvious coherence will result. But if like interacts with like, then we tend to find the emergence of intelligible patterning in the behavior. Remember, of course, the system, the idealized autonomous system is a fiction. All systems are at all times immersed in the world. Um, so if we see multiple interacting systems and we see the emergence of a superordinate order, we've met the word emergence before, remember the pinwheels and the puppy dogs, then we can speak of the systems in training each other. Here's a lovely demonstration using metronomes. This is from Lancaster University. We here have five autonomous systems, each with a slightly different driving frequency, and they're not really affecting each other. The example is useful because it illustrates a couple of things, not just one. Obviously, you heard the emergent synchronization, but you also heard that synchronization coming and going. After the plank is raised onto the two Coke cans, the metronomes more or less synchronize, and then they desynchronize, and then they synchronize, and then they desynchronize. In this way, we can see that the coupling between them is of such a strength that it allows the autonomous behavior of each individual system to manifest itself. So this is a kind of a weak or uh, soft coupling between the metronomes, such that they retain elements of their independence while also enter into, entering into meaningful patterns with others. I hope you can see that this is providing us with thinking tools for thinking about human patterning, uh, the pattern of sociality, uh, mutuality and joint achievements. Right, so this is, the last two units have given us our um, basic vocabulary, which we get when we shift framework from the kind of explanation found in the world of connectionist modeling or in many kinds of cognitive psychology. We now have a, a set of formal tools with which to approach the study of human behavior, and they will allow us to map from our model to the world in ways that are peculiar to this tool. Remember, all along as we've been doing the connectionist modeling, I've been very keen to stress that the relationship of any numbers in the model to anything in the world lies in the responsibility and interpretation of the researcher. Numbers themselves are meaningless. And we saw that there were some pretty wild mappings going on there. An 18-bit vector for an image who justified that? We saw some attempts to create systematic representations of phonology. We saw that, in general, it's a very much a non-trivial task how we map from elements in the model to elements in the world. And this doesn't solve that problem, but it does give us a whole bunch of new toys to work with. So we've met the central ideas of the state and the dynamic. We've met the three kinds of attractors, point attractor, limit cycle attractor, and chaotic attractor. We've met the phenomenon of oscillation and the intricacies of chaos. We've met the distinction between transience and long-term behavior. We've got the rich notion of autonomy. We've spoken of coupling and entrainment. 
And in all these, we have formal tools for talking about them. The state space is well defined. The vector field gives us a visual overview of the behavior of the system in general. A trajectory gives us the time course of an individual specific instance given initial conditions. We've got the relationship between dynamics and kinematics where we can inquire not only into the form of movement but into the causal origins of movement. We've got the distinction between parameters and variables that allow us to be self-conscious about the framing of our model and to relax that as we change parameters we're dealing with a slightly different model all the time. We've seen the importance of initial conditions and we've seen this um, very fertile notion of bifurcation. Um, so those are a lot of tools to take on board and in the final unit we're going to see some non-representative but very important worked examples of the application of dynamical systems theory to um, the scientific study of human behaviour.